Cliff always used to say, save that for afterwards. Um, now, I, I, I can't stand up, comrades, and I apologise for that. I've tried it, but I can't do it. So I'm very sorry. But as I thought I'd start off um, with a quotation, uh, or two quotations, from when I was last sitting here, which was two years ago. I was sitting here with Tony Benn. I used this quotation from Benn's uh, diaries, 1987, which he published in 1987, not about 1987, but he published it in 1987. Parliamentary democracy is, in truth, little more than a means for securing a change in the management team, which is then allowed to preside over a system that remains in essence intact. If the British people were ever, ever to ask themselves what power they truly enjoyed under the present political system, they would be amazed to discover how little it is, <clears throat> and some new chartist agitation might be born and might quickly gather momentum. I used that quotation when I was speaking with him then, and then in the summing up, he used another a sentence which I'm, I, I want to be a sort of theme for what I'm saying here today, which is, he said, I am not in favour of socialists outside the Labour Party organising separately. I think he says that, um, I don't know if he said it this year, but he says it pretty well every year, or he ends up with some similar conclusion. And um, the basic points the difference that I want to talk about today is that the difference between working and making pro propaganda and trying to agitate for a revolutionary movement in society on the one hand and then being against any kind of organisation to do that. That's the theme I want to follow when talking about the Chartists. And the Chartists is a tremendously long and tremendously rich story which extends over a period of ten years, really from 1838 to 1848. And impossible for anyone to try and tell that story at a meeting of this kind. And therefore I have to pick out just themes. And the theme, based on those two quotations, I'm going to pick out a particular theme. And what I hope is, because I know that there are people here who know an awful lot about this subject, is that you will fill in those gaps uh, when you come to speak after this. Now, the Charter took, was based, the reason for the Charter, which was published in 1838, was a piece of legislation which was called the Great Reform Act. It's called the Great Reform Act by conventional historians for whatever it is, well over, um, um, well, well over 150 years now. And the reason why they refer to it as the Great Reform Act is that it was not great and it had nothing to do with reform. <laughs> That, that's roughly how you judge uh, historians when they come up with a catchphrase like the Great Reform Act. I'm not great, no reform. After the Great Reform Act, after this great measure, which meant <laughs> such sweeping significance for the British, uh, there were still 219 members of Parliament in the House of Commons who together, collectively, were, ele were elected with 1,400 votes. And we could do quite well on that basis. Uh, <laughs> If, if, we, if, if we could get 219 MPs for every 1,400 votes. But I mean, the point is that the system of representation in Parliament, both before and after the Great Reform Act, was not representative at all. It represented not the people, but property. It was strictly and solely representative of property and the people who supported property. And, and uh, it was not just the Great Reform Act which caused the Charter to be published. There were other things that happened as a result of the Great Reform Act. A Whig government was elected, more reactionary even than the Tory government that it replaced. And the Whig government introduced a series of uh, laws and legislation, all of which were designed to attack the, the poor. The most obvious was the Poor Law Amendment Act, which took away the, even the very basic means that uh, very, very poor people could get under the old system and replaced it by placing people in the workhouse, which was the most terrible degradation. Prisons, really, for the poor. And simultaneously with the attacks on the poor came attacks on organised workers, wherever they organised. The Tolpuddle Martyrs were sent to Australia in 1834. The Glasgow Spinners' Strike was broken and its leaders deported in 1836. So there was a simultaneous attack, not only on the poor, but also on the workers who organised to improve the situation of the poor. And that, these things led to the publication of the Charter in 1838. Now, when you look and see what the Charter actually argued for, it seems, I mean, especially now, all these years later, it seems really mundane, very ordinary, universal male suffrage, not female suffrage, vote by ballot, 
payment of MPs, regular sittings, no property qualifications for MPs and annual parliaments. Those were the six points of the Charter in, uh, uh, in 1838. And on, 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 in themselves, what they were, were just technical, most of them were just technical, around the basis of people voting. All about people voting, technical, uh, te technical provisions, to make sure that the voting was reasonably fair, equal member constituencies, things of that kind. That was what the Charter was about. And looking back on it, it's very difficult to understand how it led to the most fantastic agitation and anger uh, in that, immediate, almost immediately after it was published in 1838 and all through 1839. It's difficult to realise it if you separate off the political uh, proposals in the Charter with the economic reality of what was existing at the time. A, a very, very serious economic crisis, desperate poverty, almost indescribable poverty of very, very large numbers of people and, and hideous exploitation taking place in the workplace. The, the, the father of Chartism, as he later became known, was a man called Bronte. He called himself Bronte in order to associate himself with the French Revolution. That was not his name. He was an Irishman, but he called himself Bronte. And Bronte O'Brien wrote many articles in The Poor Man's Guardian, which started to be published in 1831 and went on through the 1830s, or through the early 1830s anyway, a, 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 a remarkable publication, one of the first ever working class publications ever to be published. And this is what he, uh, I'm just going to read two quotations from Bronte O'Brien in 1834, which was a hideous year for the working class, Tol Palomatas and all the rest. The history of mankind shows that from the beginning of the world, the rich of all countries have been in a permanent state of conspiracy to keep down the poor of all countries. And for this plain reason, because the poverty of the poor, the poverty of the poor man, is essential to the riches of the rich man. No matter by what means they may disguise their operations, the rich are everlastingly plundering, debasing and brutalising the poor. You might think that that must have come from Marx. And maybe people think, and I don't think it did come from Marx, actually, because Marx, in 1834, was 16 years old. And although a very precocious teenager, was certainly not capable of summarising his position so uh, ably as uh, Bronte O'Brien did in, uh, in, 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 in The Poor Man's Guardian. Then side by side with that analysis came this analysis which, 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 which refused to separate the political demands which later became associated with Chartism, and the economic demands of the sort of people that Bronte felt that he was representing. The point that he was making was that the capitalist system, which did all this plundering, was essentially an undemocratic system. I mean, not, uh, uh, it didn't just turn out that it was undemocratic, it was central to the whole basis of capitalism that there was no dem democracy in it. He, he wrote, for instance, the factory is governed by an autocrat, who is self-elected and responsible to no one, and the whole class that ruled were not elected and not responsible. And so he concluded, become your own governors in the workshop, as well as out of it. Universal suffrage can be of little use if applied only to political purposes. In fact, it is only as an auxiliary to social reform, or as a means of protecting the multitude in the establishment of new institutions for the production and distribution of wealth, that universal suffrage will develop its virtues. Now, when you consider that was written in 1834, I think that tells us more, in, in a way, about parliamentary democracy and the history of parliamentary democracy than pretty well an awful lot of things that have been said since about it. But it showed the, the state of uh, uh, agitation and the state of anger that existed inside the working class at that time. It was not just directed at the question of having the vote, you had a vote to have a purpose for a vote, which was to establish some sort of equality and fairness in the society. Democracy was not uh, a political thing composed of how you voted and when you voted and in which constituencies you voted only. It was there precisely to shift the balance of economic power. That was the purpose of the democracy. And... Um, the Chartist movement which followed the publication of the Charter in 1838 really rises, and I'm cutting this story short all the time, but it rises to three great climaxes over the next ten years. And they're all clim climaxes of agitation, I mean, climaxes of people doing things, activating, campaigning, going on strike, all sorts of things, doing them to uh, draw people's attention to the case for the Charter. 
And the greatest of the three, of all the three uh, climaxes, the greatest was the first climax in 1839. In fact, I think it's true to say that in 1839, Britain came closer to revolution than ever before and even than ever since, even if you include 1830, which was a tumultuous year, 1919, which was a tremendous year for, for, for the working people, even 1972, which was a tremendous year. I mean, remember Cliff writing, 1972, what a wonderful year for the workers. Even these, year, these years, the, the, greater, the, the closest the, the, the British workers came to revolution was in 1839. And what happened was that there was just an overwhelming series of meetings, I mean absolutely vast meetings, torchlight meetings, illegal meetings, meetings at night. There was a manufacture of arms all over the country, especially in the northeast, tremendous number of arms being made. The ruling class were set into complete panic by this operation. They set off their general, but the general, who was a supporter of the charter by the way, that is, he was a supporter of the political demands in the Charter, but not the economic demands which the Charter represented. The general, whose name was Napier, was very cautious about where he went. He called the Chartist leaders together. He said, I don't want any unpleasantness here. You know, we, we must stop the unpleasantness if we can. And they said, well, they didn't, weren't really interested in stopping the unpleasantness. Indeed, they were interested in increasing the unpleasantness. <laughs> and this was, this was what was the, the reaction that, uh, that they had to him then. What was required in this situation of, of tumult, which is very difficult to describe in words, in the great situation of tumult that existed in the summer of 1839, what was required was a decisive move by the Chartists, by the people on the side of the Chartists, a move which would unite them behind their demands and which would I increase their self-confidence. And there was a move along those lines, by the Chartist Convention, which was then the leadership of the Chartists, and that was to call for what they, what was used to be known in the old days as a national holiday, that is, a national strike. There was a move to, to set off a general strike right across the country in support of the Charter. And almost as soon as they made the demands, the members of the Chartist Convention that carried the greatest weight started to back away from it. Bronte O'Brien was, I think, one of the very first people to say he wasn't in favour of the national strike. And the reason he gave was that he said that the support for the strike was, and I use his exact words, not uniform throughout the country. That it was very strong in some places and weak in another. It was not uniform. Uh, we could say to him now, if you like, or it's also true, it was tr as true then as it is now, that no activity of that kind, no action of that kind, is ever uniform. It's always split between the people who are very, very strong for action on the one hand and the people who don't want any action on the other. There's always that division between the people who want to move and the people who don't want to move. And it never operates as an excuse to do nothing. It can never be used as an excuse to do nothing. It's always an argument for going ahead and doing it. But Bronte O'Brien and increasingly other members of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Chartist leadership uh, took that view about the the, um, the, the lack of uniformity for the demand of, of interest in the strike in the country at large and the strike was called off and the strike was called off by the leadership and of course in the very week that it was called off the ruling class re regained their uh, offensive and went around uh, uh, people were arrested who had anything whatever to do with the strike they were charged with various conspiracy charges uh, there was a, a, a final flurry of activity at the end of, of, of 1839 in which an armed body of people, an armed body of men, invaded Newport and were quickly shot down or suppressed by a small contingent of, uh, of the British Army. The three people who were held as, as leaders, the leaders of that, uh, John Frost, Zephaniah, uh, Zephaniah and William Jones, these, these three leaders were arrested and charged. The judge ordered them to be hung, drawn and quartered for their association with that, uh, with that revolt. They weren't, in fact, undrawn and quartered, partly because of the protest movement that that set up. But they were, they were, um, they, they were, they were sent to Tasmania, deported. And so, the, the head, if you like, the head of Chartism, as soon as it had given way and called off the strike, was immediately cut off. And most people, most of the rulers assumed that that would be the end of the matter. But the incredible thing about the movement is that it wasn't the end of the matter. That, as it were, headless... It went on without a leadership until it formed another leadership. 
so that the second wave of agitation is in 1842, when the economic conditions were even worse than they were in 1839, when the number of people out of work in the, in, in the industrial areas was something like 50% of the total number of people that could have been working. And uh, the Chartist movement under new leaders, leaders, this time working men, people were actually working in factories, mainly in the Manchester area, Richard Pilling, Alexander Hutchinson, people of that kind, launched again another great petition. They'd had a petition in 1839, a petition for the Charter, which had had one, about one and a half million signatures. In 1842, they had three and a half million signatures calling for the Charter to be caught, uh, uh, brought into law. All these petitions, of course, were utterly dismissed by the Parliament, which was unrepresented. Obviously, they couldn't understand why anyone should want to increase uh, the representation in Parliament, since they were very happy with the representation that they had already. So, it, 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 uh, uh, um, the... The, the petition was called out, called, uh, the petition went down to, to Parliament and was ignored. And in its place, there took, there happened what should have happened in 1839, which was a general strike, first real general strike in this country, one which people have written about very, very uh, often since. The general strike was based on people turning other people out. Now we called it picketing out. Then they called it turnout. And the turnout spread all through those areas, started in the potteries in the Midlands, went up from the potteries and up into Manchester, up to all the Manchester uh, uh, suburbs, Ashton, Hyde, Staley Bridge, Manchester itself. One after another, they all came out. So the whole city of Manchester w was out on strike. And out on strike for several weeks in August and in September 1842. The leadership had called the strike, the Charter Associations, but it was immediately arrested. It was immediately arrested, and having been arrested, the whole association d d d dissolved. So there was, there was no leadership at all during the period of the strike. And in the end, that was called off. And, and when that one was called off, there was an even greater round of repression that took place in 1842. So that all these people, anyone I've mentioned up to now, was certain to have been arrested. That Fergus O'Connor, who was one of the Chartist leaders, was tried uh, with uh, 53 other other men who had been engaged in the strike. And they're, 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 actually, the result of the strike was not very satisfactory for the rulers. It was rather unsatisfactory in that they got off on the major charges. But nevertheless, uh, the, 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 the threat of being charged with conspiracy and sedition as a result of your activity in the strike was there very strongly. And there were plenty of people who were deported as a result of that. And the third phase, so we've had two phases of great agitation. The third phase in 1848 the year of revolutions all over Europe, led to another phase of agitation w among the Chartists, a phase of agitation which led to another petition which was ignored by the House of Commons. And the point was to take the petition to the House of Commons and many people then believed that there would be such a mighty organisation, such a mighty uh, procession, as it was called at the time, that it, that it would uh, finally bring the government to its knees and force them to adopt the Charter. But in fact what the government did was that they packed all the bridges all the bridges of London with, uh, with, with um, um, special constables and, uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 simply said, well, you can have a meeting, you can have a meeting in Kennington Common, I had plenty of those in our life, you can have a meeting in Kennington Common, but you can't have the procession. And this was accepted by the Chartist leaders at the time. And so that was called off, and as a result of that, there was a, a sudden, a huge attack uh, by the state uh, on, the, on the Chartist movement. Um, uh, if you read John Savile's account of 1848 it's a very good book one of the best books on the Chartists there aren't that many good books on the Chartists but John Savile's account of 1848 you see there the beginning of this idea that really the law is there to be twisted for the ruling class the whole of the he, he calls all the attacks on the Chartist leaders after the 1840, uh, 1848 uprising had, had been quelled exercises in miscarriages of justice. He described them as that. That it was all sorts of attempts of uh, finding bogus, bogus uh, uh, people who would lie in court, bogus witnesses, anyone who would come along and denounce anybody, their, their, their evidence was taken. And then again, there was another whole series of, uh, of deportations and terrible imprisonments and then treatment of people in prison, like Ernest Jones, for instance, terrible treatment of him when he got to prison. So, I suppose those of you who are doing GCSE, not that there seem to be many of you actually engaged in that at the moment, but uh, 
uh, might ask the question which is certainly always asked in a GCSE question, rather like the international law paper which I once did which always started off, is there such a thing as international law? And if you answered no, which is the true answer, you got marked down, you never know on paper. <laughs> the same thing is, uh, exists with Chartism really. The question is, did Chartism fail? And of course, it's one of those things where the answers are perfectly obvious. If you're saying, did they achieve what they set out to achieve, which is the six points of the Charter, then the answer is yes, Chartism did fail. But there are various lessons I just want to draw out of all that agitation, which seem to me just as important today as they were then. The first was, of course, that what was called at the time the terrible tide of thought and energy. What Shelley called when he called the spirit that lifts the slave before his lord. That was the most outstanding thing of all those three great agitations were the whole ten years of agitation at that time. Dragging people out of the mediocrity of their lives, dispelling the muck of ages, bringing people face to face with their own powers, their own possibility that they themselves can change the society. So that everywhere you went, everywhere, people were... This, this happened in... And I, I mean, all of you should, should look at the area where you lived and see what happened in the area where you lived, where people, quite ordinary people who were just going about their daily lives, suddenly became members of committees, secretaries of committees, chairs of committees, and the whole thing spread. So that was the, that is the, the chief thing that came out. And not just, and it wasn't just something that existed um, in, um, it, 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 not just something exciting that was going on all the time, it dragged everybody from every area of society. You know, the most unlikely people, Robert Lowry, who was a great Chartist leader, was disabled so that he couldn't walk at all. William Cuffe, who was the, one of the great dissidents of Chartism in 1848, he was black. And, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, uh, uh, the Charter called for universal male suffrage. But much to the surprise of the men, because the women weren't included in the thing at all, was the activity of the women, which was quite extraordinary during the whole period of the Chartist agitation. Uh, Dorothy Thompson, who's uncovered a lot of this in her book about the Chartist, she has this, uh, this little episode. The Northern Star, and that was the paper of the Chartists, by the way, which is another extraordinary aspect of it, was that they had this paper which came out every week and which was tremendously popular. The Northern Star recorded with delight the dialogue which took place between Mrs. King of Manchester and Richard Webb, registrar for the district. Webb, what is the child to be called? This is a christening that's about to take place. What is the child to be called? Mrs. King. James Fergus O'Connor King. <laughs> Mr. Webb, is your husband a Chartist? Mrs. King, I don't know, but his wife is. <laughs> Mr. Webb, are you the child's mother? Mrs. King, yes. Mr. Webb, you had better go home and consider it again. For if the person that you were naming your child after was to commit high treason and get hanged, what a thing that would be! <laughs> to which she says, If that should be the case, I should then consider it an honour to have my child called after him, so that I shall never have him out of my memory as long as the child lives. For I think Fergus O'Connor a, a great deal honester man than those who are punishing him. Mr. Webb, well, if you're determined to have it named after him, I must name it. But I never met such an obstinate lady as you before. <laughs> Mr. Webb then registered the child by the above name. <laughs> I mean, <coughs> it's, um, th that's, that's the first point I want to make, the tremendous agitation that extended through all these different areas of society. And the second point that emerges from, very clearly from the Chartist agitation is this notion that somehow history is something made up of neutral facts, that is, the historians look at things and they assess and things that are, uh, certain events or things that happen are nailed down as facts. They're facts and you build your story around the facts. Uh, of course, we know that that isn't the case at all. But again, if you read John Savile's account of um, uh, the 1848, the 1848 <coughs> you see there that after 1848, after the third Chartist uprising, the whole of the uprising, the whole ten years was simply wiped out of history. For fifty years, no one officially mentioned the Chartists. 
There was a book about the Chartists which was written by a man called Gamage, who was, who was himself a moderate Chartist, and that was published quite early on. But apart from that book, in the whole of the next 50 years, in fact, arguably, in the whole of the next 70 or 80 years, there is practically nothing admitted that for 10 years the whole of the society was dominated by this agitation from below. So, little, utterly trivial things that are taking place in Victorian society. Utterly trivial, marginal, minor little things that affect kings and queens and politicians and Gladstone and Disraeli and all this stuff. All that is there, hundreds of, there's, there, there's an endless amount of, of that in history. Endless things you have to toil through when you're reading history of that period. But this great agitation, this great uprising, this series of uprisings that took place is completely buried. Until you don't, not until you get right on into the 20th century that you get people talking about the Chartists. In fact, it's a bit like the, 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 the 40 Towers, you know, don't talk about the war, don't mention the Chartists. Because if anyone mentions the Chartists, they might start doing that sort of thing again, and we ever see that they don't do that. Now, the, the other point I want to make is, is the, the, the third point that emerges from this, is this point that I made at the beginning, which is the point about democracy. See, here we are in, in um, 2004, all the points of the Charter, except for annual parliaments, which is by far the most democratic demand, apart from universal suffrage, all the points of the Charter have been conceded. And now, it's, it's 1867, skilled workers, skilled male workers got the vote. 1884, uh, uh, agricultural male workers got the vote. 1918, the rest of the male workers and some women got the vote. 1929, the other women got the vote. 1970, people under 21 got the vote. Now they're talking, you know, Blair and all the others going around saying, well, we could extend it. You know, we should, maybe we can get, uh, give the vote to people of 16. And the very interesting thing is that although all those concessions have been made, Although all those developments have taken place, people seem less and less interested in voting. So how do you explain that? The only way in which you can explain this, in my view, is by this separation. That what distinguished the Chartist agitation, what made it so terrifying to the rulers, was that they combined the idea of political democracy with the idea of social democracy, if you like, or socialist democracy, or economic democracy, whatever you want to call it. But they were, and what has happened since is that by giving this thing bit by bit, giving in, they've managed to maintain the separation whereby the political right to vote continues. People get, people get elected and they have the right to elect it. But the economic consequences which the Chartists demanded have been ignored. And increasingly in the 20th century, the notion of social democracy, which was the idea that you should use the democracy in order to make the society more egalitarian, more equal, all that has been gradually uh, 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 surrendered, so that in the end you have the final surrender, sort of new Labour surrender, of, of saying, well, we not only give up the socialism, but we also give up the democracy. That is what's happening now. And that is because of this separation. I, I, you know, I know we like to have a few texts in these, uh, these meetings, and I, you know, there's plenty of them uh, in the, on, this, on this question. In 1845, in the middle of the second and the third uh, agitations, Engels wrote, the six points of the Charter are, for the proletarian, a mere means to further end. Political power are means. Social happiness are ends, is now the clearly formulated war cry of the Chartists. And Marx later, in 1852, in a, in a quotation that has always puzzled me until I studied the Chartists and began to understand what was going on, the carrying of universal suffrage in England would therefore be a far more socialistic measure than anything which has been honoured by that name on the continent. Its inevitable result here is the political supremacy of the working class. Now, it was not the inevitable result uh, uh, that universal suffrage would lead to the political supremacy of the working class. I, don't, I certainly don't need to argue that here. It plainly was not. So what, what, what was he talking about? He was talking about a movement which combines the argument for democracy with the argument for socialism, economic democracy, whatever else you want to call it. And the two are combined and have to be constantly combined. And if they're not combined, then the political democracy is just a shadow of what the Chartists were actually looking for. So, and the final point, I come back to, to Tony Benn, which is the point about leadership. See, of course it's on the first point about his first quotation about the need to campaign for Chartists at the same time when he said he was going he was leaving politics to um, well it was shortly before but it was leaving politics to take uh, leaving Parliament to take part in politics 
It's perfectly poss possible, of course, to campaign for the sort of uh, 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 Chartist revolution that the Chartists were after. It, 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 nor is it likely to be all the time unfruitful. I mean, you cannot bash workers all... You can't have a system based on the rich bashing the poor, surviving forever, without from time to time the poor uh, uh, organising in revolution against it. But coming out of this very plainly, then, is the question what we call the question of the vanguard. See, it, it is often said to you, well, you, you people, you, you set yourself in a, as potential leaders of the working class. You are vanguardists, they say. You know, to take Tony Benn's second statement, that he doesn't approve of people outside the Labour Party organising, uh, organising separately. He doesn't approve of that. Take that for the moment. Now, people say, vanguard... The vanguard, you, you're a, you, you, you're a vanguard. Now, if you just think about it a little bit. Every expression of opinion, no matter how mild, every expression of political opinion is an expression of a vanguard. What do you think about this? The worst people are people who say, oh, I don't, I don't have a view on that. I remember canvassing and people would say, well, I'll need to wait for the husband or for the wife to find out, you know, what I, what I think about it. Those are always the worst people. They're, they're, they're the absolute opposite of the vanguard. They're the sort of, the rear guard taken to extreme. I've got no view about anything. I don't have a view. But the minute you express a view, the minute you express a view, you're, you're putting yourself in the vanguard. In, it, it, the, the minute you say, I think we should do this, I think we should have a demonstration. I think we should uh, refuse to... Uh, I don't know, anything. We should refuse to send our child to this school. Something of that kind. Any, the minute you express an opinion about what you are going to do about something, then you're talking, then you are in the political vanguard, whether you like it or not. And therefore people who say, oh, you do, all you're doing is putting yourself in the vanguard. What we're, we're saying is, there is an unevenness in the society. There plainly is an unevenness in capitalist society. There's an unevenness in the opposition to capitalist society. And the important thing is to bring together those elements in the people most anxious to contest capitalist society into, if you like, an organised vanguard. Yes, that's exactly what we mean. We're not at all ashamed about it. To say, this is what we think we should do. Not just one person thinks what he, we should do, but what we should do together. So there's a one, two sticks are infinitely stronger. Two sticks when bound together infinitely stronger than one stick on its own and so on and so forth a thousand sticks ten thousand sticks tremendously much stronger than those sticks independently with their opinions and their views and therefore the lessons of the Chartist uprising is that three times in 1839 1842 and 1848 the leadership failed failed to take the thing further they failed to, to, to see the revolutionary consequences of what they were doing. Failed to say, no, no, we've got to persevere with this. We mustn't let them go. We must have a strike in 1839. We mu we, we've been dissolved in 1842, but we need a, an alternative leadership to press on with what we were doing in 1842. And we need to take on those special constables in the bridges in 1848. You needed a leadership to do it. Never, never clearer, if you like, in the whole of our history. That what we need now is a leadership that does thrill to the dynamic of the revolutionary potential in, in, in the working class. A leadership which, which is strong enough to resist political and judicial repression and to replace itself if it is uh, politically and judicially repressed and that links the interests of all, all, the, uh, all people of all the colours and all activities in, in, this, in this single aim. A leadership that understands the past in order to understand the present. That's one of the things that's crucial about any such revolutionary organisation. And I think that nothing could be more important than those things today. In fact, I think it grows in importance. And so, I think Tony Benn was quite right to expect and hope for another Chartist agitation, and absolutely right to campaign for it, and nobody does it better than he does. But on the other hand, I think he's quite wrong to deny the responsibility of anyone who thinks like that to combine to cooperate with one another and build an organisation that can make proper use of the revolt whenever and however it happens. I know there may be people who think that, um, there may be people here, I don't know, you feel at moments of despair who think, this bloody downturn, you know, we talked about the downturn, 
28 years of downturn is really a bit hard to have to cope with. I mean, it does seem really intolerable that for all these years, especially if you were involved, I mean, I know fewer and fewer were, but if you were involved in, in the early 1970s, in the, in the great strikes of 1972 and so on, there's nothing more sickening than to see this constant down, downturn that people not being prepared to take on, not being prepared to, to activate themselves. And, and it, is, it is very depressing, and there's not much we can do about it, comrades, except organise for when it does happen. That is, uh, go on organising. I and mean, it isn't something that's separate through what's happening at the moment. We can only organise effectively if we do it all the time uh, in concert with what's going on. And uh, I, as I mentioned Shelley earlier, I also have a quotation here from, from Byron, because Byron was, he was much more satirical than Shelley, much more, um, much more likely to crack jokes than Shelley was. And uh, also, somebody who had doubts, which I always find rather attractive. You know, he actually, he wasn't certain of, of which way he was going or what to do about it. And there's a, when he wrote his great poem, um, Don Juan, you know, towards the end of his very short life, uh, it's, it's a, 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 a terrific satire on the existence of society at that time, on the way in which it operated, on war, and all the rest of these things. Wonderful. But he, in one chapter he comes down to it, he says, he talks about the, 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 the struggle between David and Goliath, between the giant of uh, the existing order and the David that's throwing stones at it, and how the thing develops, and how how the, the, the struggle develops into the, the, the Davids getting angrier and angrier and throwing more and more stones. And then, and then he says, then comes the tug of war. It is coming yet, I rather doubt. And I would soon say, fie on it, if I had not perceived that revolution alone can cure the world of hell's pollution. Right, that'll do.